Hello again, and uh, welcome back together as a group, a very large group um, in the main hall. I have to tell you how terrific the room looks from this perspective, looking at 1,300 faces staring back at us. It really brings the whole hall to life. Uh, when it's an empty room, you could hide an aeroplane in it, but it looks, it looks terrific like this, full of people. Anyway, for the next hour or so, um, you're in for a real treat because we have been lucky enough to get an absolutely first-rate keynote speaker to talk to us uh, this morning. Facing challenges and forging connections in many ways could be the touchstone for the entire conference. And so it's very fortunate and not entirely coincidental that it's also the subject about which our keynote speaker is going to be talking. Professor Kumaro Vadivelu is Professor of Applied Linguistics and TESOL at San Jose University in the United States. And as many of you know, he's been sharing his experience and insights with teachers and teacher educators for many years in various capacities in just about every continent on the globe. Consequently, he's a very familiar name uh, to many of us, uh, both at conferences partly due to his long and deep expertise in the area of language teacher education, but also from his many publications. And there are a couple that stand out for me, um, the obvious ones, I suppose, Culture, Globalization, and Language Education, and more recently, Language Teacher Education for a Global Society. And I certainly urge those of you who haven't read those books um, to find a copy, buy it, read it, and digest it, because it's well worth it. But as I said, we're lucky today because we have uh, Professor Kumar in the flesh uh, to talk to us about um, the topic in hand and to share his unique insights in the field of language teacher education. Just to note, we won't be having a question and answer session at the end of this keynote uh, speech, but Professor Kumar will be holding a coffee shop at the end of day two tomorrow at 5.15 in room 203, which is one of the bigger rooms, so that anyone who wants to come along and discuss any aspect of his speech, uh, he's more than happy to talk more uh, in person with you then. So that's an opportunity uh, not to miss, I would say. Consequently, all that remains for me now is to ask you to give an extremely warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Kumar, who's gonna talk about English language teacher education facing challenges, forging connections. Please come up to the stage. Thank you for your short and sweet introduction, Dr. Paul Davis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here with you today. The very fact that you're all here today demonstrates your extraordinary commitment to your professional development. And I want to thank the British Council and the English and Foreign Languages University for giving me this opportunity. And I wish to commend the organizers for selecting a conference theme that's highly relevant and timely, and also for putting together a program with an incredible ra range of topics, some of which will be focusing on very specific skills and strategies. I have no doubt whatsoever that you will find them useful and usable. What I am planning to do, however, is to give you the big picture as I see it. And what I see in different parts of the world is an extraordinary awareness and recognition that the ongoing processes of economic, cultural, and educational globalization present unprecedented challenges and also unlimited possibilities for educators everywhere. In fact, I see a very close connection between globalization 
and education. And the relationship is expanding at a tremendous speed. And I also see a dialectical relationship between the two, meaning globalization nourishes education and education supports globalization. And therefore, what seems to be happening, for good or ill, is that more and more global entities are now getting involved in investing in local education. In fact, some of the most renowned international firms, like McKinsey and Company, are getting involved in education, and they have started giving recommendations and advice, not only to governments everywhere, but also to educational institutions. And you may know that there are a number of universities in the United States which are competing with each other in order to open overseas campuses. And just a few years ago, 10 leading universities from 10 different countries formed the International Alliance of Leading Education Institutes. And their main focus seems to be to become a global think tank towards actually shaping the educational policies and practices around the world. And it looks as if Indian policymakers are also paying attention, not only to education and also teacher education. And I am very happy to see that more and more attention is being given to teacher education. The alliance that I just mentioned released a report in the year 2008, and it's titled Transforming Teacher Education. And in that report, they say, notwithstanding their origins, commonalities, and differences, all systems of teacher preparation have to rethink their core assumptions and processes in the new global context. And as if to echo the same sentiment, the report released by the high-level commission set up by the Supreme Court of India just last year very appropriately warned us that current teacher education programs offer ritualistic exposure to fragmented knowledge, which is neither linked to the larger aims of education and disciplinary knowledge, nor to the ground realities of classroom practice. Not without coincidence, both the reports are emphasizing the need to develop what's called a transformative teacher education. In fact, one word that keeps occurring again and again in these two reports is transformation. Now, if you are really serious about developing a transformative teacher education, then I believe we need to reconsider some of our basic assumptions. And I wish to talk about at least three of them. Number one, we need to shift from a linear, discrete approach to cyclical, holistic approach to language teacher education. In most of the language teacher education programs that I know, what they offer is a series of discrete classes, courses, in linguistic systems, learning theories, teaching methods, curriculum design, testing assessment, etc., and usually ending with a practicum or practice teaching. Now, because of this linearity, and discreteness of the courses offered, most of our student teachers fail to develop a holistic understanding. And therefore, they are unable to see the pattern that connects. Second, we need to shift from transmission to transformation. 
Most of the transmission models of teacher education are information oriented. They are not inquiry oriented. And they are primarily designed to transfer a set of predetermined, pre-selected, pre-sequenced body, usually a dead body of knowledge to teachers. And these models do not enable teachers to construct their own vision of teaching and their own versions of teaching. Finally, we need to move from the concept of method to the concept of post-method. <clears throat> not many people seem to realize that the transmission models of teacher education are closely connected to the concept of method. They are twins. They are the result of top-down exercises. And I have written extensively on post-method pedagogy, and therefore I will not go into details. But briefly, post-method pedagogy seeks not an alternative method, but an alternative to method. And the goal here is to help our teachers become strategic thinkers, strategic teachers, and strategic explorers of their classrooms. Now, given the global developments and the need to shift our assumptions, a logical question arises. Are we ready to face the challenges? The answer, in my opinion, is a resounding no. That's because very few of us seem to realize that education and teacher education are social institutions that pose moral, ethical, social, philosophical, and ideological questions. But unfortunately, the models that we have put in place today cannot find suitable answers to those questions. The statement made by these two American educators is also true not only of education in general, but also of ELT. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we in ELT have not made any progress. Of course, we have. And all we need to look at are the titles of some of the books that have come about in the last 10 or 15 years. Here is a brief list. There are books about teacher voice, teacher research, teacher freedom, teacher narrative, teacher coherence, teacher values, teacher experience, teacher cognition, teacher philosophy, teacher reflection, teacher emotions, and there is more. A very impressive list of scholarship indeed. But let's be honest. These are what I call accumulated entities. Bits and pieces of disjointed knowledge cannot constitute a cogent, comprehensive framework. Or, to put it more eloquently, in the words of a French philosopher, a cartload of bricks is not a house. Think about it. A cartload of bricks is not a house. We want a principle, a system, an integration. Ladies and gentlemen, what I have attempted to do is to collect some bricks from the professional literature, put them together to build a house. I'm sorry I do not have time to take you on a grand tour of my house. But I will show you the short version of the blueprint of my house.
And the, my, my house consists of three operating principles, which for me are equivalent to foundational stones. And those of you who are familiar with my work on post-method pedagogy may recall these three principles. The principle of particularity is taken from hermeneutic science. It talks about how situational understanding is very crucial, which means that you just cannot produce anything beneficial and useful unless you fully understand the local conditions. Because all pedagogy, like all politics, is local. Therefore, language teaching and teacher education must be sensitive to a particular group of teachers teaching a particular group of learners, pursuing a particular set of goals within a particular institutional context embedded in a particular socio-cultural milieu. The second principle, practicality, focuses on the dichotomy between theory and practice. In our field, as in other fields as well, you see a debilitating division of labor between the theorist and the teacher. The theorist produces knowledge, and you, the teachers, are expected to consume knowledge. Don't you dare to produce knowledge. That's not your business. So that kind of an approach leaves only a very narrow room for teacher self-conceptualization. Therefore, teachers must be enabled to develop the knowledge, skill, attitude, and autonomy necessary to construct their own context-sensitive theory of practice. The last principle of possibility is drawn from critical pedagogy of Paulo Freire. As you know, critical pedagogy talks about the historical, political, social, and cultural factors that shape not only the life of a nation, but also the principles and practices behind education. And if you take that seriously, then teachers must become aware not only of the socio-cultural reality that shapes their lives, but more importantly, they should develop the capacity to transform those realities without becoming prisoners of those realities. And as I said somewhere, given that kind of an understanding, language teachers cannot afford to separate learners' linguistic needs and wants from their socio-cultural needs and wants. Now, these three basic principles of teacher education must be defined in such a way to help teachers focus more on the acceleration of agency than on the acceptance of authority. More on the active production of personal knowledge than on the passive application of received wisdom. And more on mastering the teaching model than on modeling the master teacher. Keeping all these in mind, I have constructed what's called the CARDS model. It's modular in nature and consists of five modules knowing, analyzing, recognizing, doing, and seeing. The choice of dynamic verbs as against static nouns is deliberate, because I want to focus on the processes of learning, teaching, and teacher education, not merely the products. I'm using the idea of knowing as proposed by Polanyi. 
And he talks about knowing as the personal participation of the knower in all acts of understanding. And it definitely entails a very passionate contribution on the part of the person who wants to know something. So it is not an empty slogan. It's a passionate desire to know. And therefore, every individual teacher has to decide what kind of knowing she or he is interested in. That does not mean that this kind of knowing is a subjective judgment. It is not, because it demands a high degree of intellectual commitment, a high degree of intellectual inquiry. And you can easily see a dialectical relationship between awareness and action, and between theory and practice. So I'm talking about three different components of knowing. Professional knowledge, procedural knowledge, and personal knowledge. The first one refers to received wisdom, facts, theories, concepts most of which are generated by the expert, therefore externally produced, not necessarily generated from the classroom. So in the context of language learning and teaching, we talk about language, we talk about learning, and we talk about teaching. And within the component of language, I have discussed language as system, language as discourse, and importantly, language as ideology. Second, when it talks about learning, we are talking about learning theories in terms of linguistic input that should be introduced to the learner, and the relationship between intake factors and intake processes. And teaching definitely refers to mostly the teacher's ability to modify input and also modify classroom interaction so that learners have the opportunity for negotiated, meaningful interaction to take place. And mostly the sources of this kind of professional knowledge are actually pre-service programs, in-service programs, books, journals, and of course, conferences like this. And closely related to professional knowledge is procedural knowledge. And I'm here merely referring to management skills and strategies for planning, implementing, monitoring, and evaluating classroom events and activities. Topic management and talk management and how to form individual work, pair work, and group work. And definitely, going back to the, the main theme of the conference, how to deal with the diversity in the classroom in terms of languages, cultures, subcultures, learning styles, and learning strategies. But more than the professional knowledge and the pr procedural knowledge, I attach a lot of importance to teachers personal knowledge, because if professional knowledge is the collective enterprise of the expert, personal knowledge is the individual endeavor of the teacher. And how does the teacher develop this? Mostly through observations, experiences, critical reflections, and interpretations, which do not happen overnight but has to be gathered over a long period of time. And this becomes a kind of a long and lonely journey on the part of the teacher. And ultimately, the teacher will be able to gain some insights and intuition, which are almost unexplained and unexplainable. And that's why Prabhu, for instance, called it a teacher's sense of possibility. And Van Menon simply called it sense-making. 
And this kind of sense making is shaped and reshaped by a continual recreation of personal meaning. And this is continuous. It's not as if you can go to a university, get a master's degree, and then say, aha, I'm done. I don't have to do any more thinking. No, personal knowledge is developed over a long period of time through constant struggle to understand what happens in the classroom. The next module is analyzing. We are all familiar with these three, learner needs, learner motivation, learner autonomy. But recent developments in the area of globalization have actually thrown at us a series of challenges. And we really need to take a re-look at all these three. They are not the same as we learned in universities a few years ago. For instance, learner needs. Global economy and the global society now demand that we help our learners develop new kinds of competencies in language, in communication skills, and in understanding intercultural relationships. Yes, it's true, most of the needs analysis are done by policymakers, institutions, and employers. But I would strongly recommend that teachers also play a supplementary role so that at the beginning of an academic year, they should be able to develop their own questionnaire, administer it in their classroom, and find out the learner needs and wants and lacks. Only by doing that, they will be able to understand learner motivation. Now, learner motivation, again, is changing. For a long time, we were told that it's the integrative motivation that's crucial, meaning the learners have to develop a love for the cultural beliefs and practices of the target language community. Later on, that was expanded to say a combination of integrative and instrumental motivation is necessary. Not so. Because these theories are hopelessly inadequate because of cultural globalization and world Englishes. Now, English is seen more as a communicational tool than as a cultural carrier. This language of coloniality is fast losing its colonial coloration. And repeated research from different parts of the world demonstrate that English language learners everywhere are now driven by the idea of global citizenship that's very firmly rooted in local identities. So in most of the countries now, they do not see English language learning and teaching as a threat to their own cultural identities no more. Therefore, scholars are now busy reconceptualizing and re-theorizing the very idea of learner motivation. Now, learner motivation, of course, is closely connected to learner autonomy. Here again, we need to redefine what we mean by learner autonomy because of cultural, economic, and educational globalization. Information technology has created much greater awareness in our learners. Every time I meet a group of young men and women in my classroom, I look at them and say, they know much more than I did when I was of their age. And that's mainly because of information technology. Therefore, they can easily play a very active role in topic selection and talk selection in the classroom. Therefore, learner-selected materials 
from social media like YouTube, blogs, they should become part of your textbook, at least supplementary texts. And even moving to a broader zone, I would like to differentiate between academic autonomy and liberatory autonomy. Academic autonomy merely refers to helping our learners, particularly learners who are first generation school goers with the learning strategies so that they can cope with the challenges of their academic program. But liberatory autonomy refers to their personal empowerment. And given those conditions, while academic autonomy can enable learners to be strategic practitioners, to realize their learning potential, liberatory autonomy can empower them to be critical thinkers in order to realize their human potential. Now, just the professional and personal knowledge and an understanding of learner needs and motivation and autonomy is not sufficient. In order to make use of that, teachers have to recognize their own identities, their own beliefs, and their own values. Now, teacher identities are closely connected to teacher activity in the classroom. Several research findings from different parts of the world, for instance, from Verges, Morgan, and Johnson in North America, Matthew Clark in Australia, Angel Lin in Hong Kong, and Sue Garten in Britain, they have all demonstrated the close connection between the identity that the teacher brings to the classroom and the teacher's performance in the classroom. So teacher identity clearly shapes their perceptions about what constitutes good learning and what constitutes good teaching. And teacher identity is not a ready-made package that can be passed on from the teacher educator to the teacher. No, it's an exploration that the teacher has to engage in before, during, and after formal institutional education. And it's an ongoing and never-ending process of being and becoming. Now, I always hear people say, the teachers really do not have the flexibility and the freedom to do what they want to do. That's true. But then, there are constraints in every aspect of life. Can you think of any aspect of your personal life which does not come with constraints? We all learn to deal with constraints and still try to achieve our objectives. Similarly, teachers, can exercise their agency, even when they are faced with very rigid state-sponsored educational policies and practices. Because ultimately, when you step into your classroom and close the door, you are the master of that mini-universe. Therefore, teacher education must help teachers become aware of their subject positions and of the possibilities and strategies for personal as well as personal uh, professional identity formation. Now, identity is closely related to beliefs as well. And what are beliefs? They are propositions that individuals feel to be true. Most often, they don't stand rigorous scrutiny at all. But still, teacher knowledge before, during, and after education is filtered through their beliefs. Because beliefs guide them in selecting and organizing knowledge and information presented to students 
and in interpreting classroom events and activities. Teacher education, therefore, must help them analyze their beliefs and to critically reflect upon those beliefs. And the literature tells us that you know, beliefs can be analyzed through teacher narratives, autobiographical reflections, etc. Now, teacher values, they, are, they have a moral and an ethical component. A teacher is a moral agent, a simple truth hidden in plain sight. We learned that from John Dewey, from Mahatma Gandhi, from Sri Aurobindo, and a number of others. Now for us as English language teachers, we have a specific responsibility because English language teaching is imbued with values and moral meaning, mainly because of its status as a global language. And as a global language, it carries global cultural flows. And teachers all the time face a lot of conflicts in their classroom, partly because they, are, they have to deal with agendas pursued by political and religious leaders or by administrators and sometimes by their own students. So in order to deal with this kind of conflicting situations, Nell Noddings has recently proposed what she called care theory. And it strikes a balance between the ethics of care and the ethics of rules. Every institution has a certain set of rules. If the teacher finds them conflicting with the care that she has towards her students, then caring takes precedence over those rules. So Nodding says it's a powerful approach to ethics and moral education in this age of globalization. Now, it's not enough if teachers know, analyze, and understand and recognize. Of course, they have to do something about it. And the doing part consists of theorizing, dialogizing, and teaching. Language teacher is essentially a transformative intellectual. And the teaching, therefore, has at least two goals. Maximizing learning opportunities in the classroom, and more importantly, mentoring the personal transformation of your learners. The first one, of course, relates to creating the conditions necessary for desired linguistic skills to develop in as short a time as possible. The second one, is important because teachers have to realize that language teaching is much more than teaching language. Helping and exploiting linguistic resources of the learners to give meaning to the lived experiences of the learner becomes an important responsibility of the teacher. Therefore, teachers must be able to reckon with the fundamental transformations of consciousness, experience, and identify that identity that are central to the shift to the historical condition of globality. So as in the case of needs and motivation, everything seems to be changing because of the impact of globalization on the education that we do all the time. Theorizing is very crucial for teachers. Theorizing is too important to be left to theories. And in order for teachers to theorize, they have to understand their classroom. Theorizing has to emerge from the classroom, not from the ivory tower. Pedagogic knowledge must emerge from the practice of everyday teaching. 
And it's the practicing teacher who is better placed to produce, understand, and apply that kind of knowledge. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not asking you to do huge research projects that are statistically laden, long term. No, I know teachers do not have the time to do that. And all I'm suggesting is, when you teach, keep your eyes and ears open. Notice what works and what doesn't work, with what group of learners, and for what reason. And think about what you find. Reflect on it again and again until you fully understand what actually happens in your classroom. That's the beginning of your exercise in theorizing. And a lot of scholars have talked about classroom-oriented research. Exploratory research, action research, teacher research, critical classroom discourse analysis. There is no dearth for teacher research ideas in the literature. The difficulty is how to choose the right one. The next component, dialogizing, refers to the dialogic interaction between meanings, between belief systems, which lead to what Bakhtin called responsive understanding. Teacher development is essentially a dialogic construction of meaning, out of which comes teacher's identity and teacher's voice. Gordon Wells recently coined the phrase, a community of inquiry. He says, the community of teachers is essentially a community of inquiry. And teachers must show a willingness to wonder, to ask questions, to seek to understand by collaborating with others in the attempt to make answers to them, and to engage in the discourse of knowledge building. Finally, the module seeing. Teachers have to see. And I'm using the word seeing with a particular meaning. And they have to do classroom-oriented exploration. And it is not enough if you very consciously prepare your lesson plan and go teach for 60 minutes and then come back home and say, wow, I have done a great job. No, that's not enough. You have to get at least three perspectives of what happened in the classroom. Your perspective, the teacher perspective, the observer perspective, and most importantly, the learner perspective. So the seeing that I'm talking about is a critically mediated idea between knowing and doing. Forging new connections between conceptual knowledge and perceptual knowledge. And teachers have to see what actually happens in their classroom. Because the classroom determines the extent to which learning potential is realized and the desired learning outcome is achieved. And nobody else is better equipped to understand what happens in the classroom than the practicing teacher. Only they can provide descriptions of their work, their thinking behind it, and their interpretations of it. But their perspective has to emerge from a systematically conducted classroom research through self-observation, self-analysis, and self-evaluation. Now, the learner perspective, something that we normally ignore, that's very crucial. Learners actually have a crucial role to play in evaluating teacher performance, because they are the stakeholders of the classroom enterprise. And as such, they bring a unique perspective of what is helpful and what is not helpful for them. 
so they can provide very valuable feedback on an ongoing basis. The more we gather learner perspective, the better and more productive our intervention will be. Now, the observer perspective ensures collaboration among interested colleagues in an institution. Meaningful, rewarding, non-threatening feedback is aimed at professional development. The goal here is to examine the philosophical orientation on the teaching performance of your colleague. So when teachers see their work in a new and critical ways, and they can engage in self-reflection based on the critical feedback they get from their observing and observant colleague. And in this endeavor, because both are partners in the exercise of professional development, nobody is marginalized and no one is privileged. And there is, of course, potential for mutual enrichment. So the house I have built, ladies and gentlemen, looks like this. It is a conceptual model. Of course, it's also a colorful model. And if you look at some of the salient features of this model, it is responsive to the ongoing demands of the global society. If anything, take it from me these demands are going to get intensified more and more. They are not going to disappear. And the model is founded on the principles of particularity, practicality, and possibility. And it is erected on the structure of interconnected modules. And each module is independent because each one has its own specific goals. Each one is a standalone entity. But at the same time, the modules are interdependent because each one shapes and is shaped by the other. In that sense, the model works as a kind of a restraining system and at the same time, a reinforcing system. And the model works in a synergic relationship where the whole is much more than the sum of the parts. And if you have noticed, this model has multiple entry points and multiple exit points, by which I mean, depending on a given group of student teachers, you can actually start at any of those five modules because they are all intercrossed anyway and move on to some other module and get back to the old one. But keep in mind, what I have come up with is no more than a set of general guidelines. It's just a conceptual framework. And local players have to construct their own context-sensitive program, taking ideas and cues from this model. Now, I know some of you may be thinking that the model that I just presented may appear to be desirable, but it's not doable. That's a thought that I completely dismiss. Because I see a pattern in the history of knowledge production. If you look at physical sciences, social sciences, life sciences, humanities, when I look at knowledge production in these fields, I get very comforting feeling because Innovation, real innovation, always starts with the desirable. And then once we know what is desirable, then we try to find ways and means of translating the desirable into the doable. 
If you begin with the doable end, the chances are that you will never get to the desirable end. The path of innovation in education is no different. One thing should be clear. Transmission models of teacher education cannot be expected to produce transformative teachers. Or to put it slightly differently, you cannot plant a cactus and expect roses to bloom. Therefore, teacher educators must create the conditions necessary for teachers to know, to analyze, to recognize, to do, and to see what constitutes learning, teaching, and teacher development. And teachers must develop the capability necessary to theorize from their practice and practice what they theorize. And both of them have to learn from the classroom constantly and continually because if you don't continue to learn, you cannot teach. A lamp can never light another lamp unless it continues to burn with its own flame. These words of wisdom came from Rabindranath Tagore more than a century ago. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, remember to keep the lamp burning all the time. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's not a, a difficult task to um, thank Professor Kumar for, for that keynote address. He's written elsewhere in a slightly different context that often there's an expectation when senior academics are asked to deliver a lecture or give a paper at a conference that the result is going to be something that's long, tedious, and boring. Well, I think he's certainly given the lie to that expectation this morning because I think what we've been listening to is extremely thought-provoking very clearly stated and unambiguous, and refreshingly evidence-based as well, and fantastic timekeeping. I didn't need to give my secret signal uh, that five minutes were coming up at all, so that was, that was terrific. Professor Kumar also promised that his keynote address was going to be quite dense, there was going to be a lot in it, and I think there is a lot there to reflect on over the coming days, and as you take some of these ideas forward in your own professional practice. Um, I particularly like that sort of foundation element of particularity, practicality, and possibility. I quite like that. I'll be using that myself in a different context um, the next conference I'm, I'm going to, I think. So I would ask you to put your hands together and thank Professor Kumar again for a fantastic <laughs> keynote address. And I think we have one of our colleagues from EFL University to present an award to uh, Professor Kumar to recognize his contribution to the conference.